This week on Fireside Chat, we give you the rundown on 13 Young Flames defensemen. We'll tell you who we think will make the NHL, and who won't. This Fireside Chat, episode 41, Future of the Blue Line, recorded March 20th, 2014. Are you ready? See you red. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. It's Dan and Matt back with you for another episode of Fireside Chat. Matt, how you doing tonight? Excellent as always. Fantastic. So we're coming off a week where we haven't had much Flames hockey. We've had two games since we recorded last. We lost to Phoenix and we won to Buffalo. And I mean, you know, neither one was a, I guess, a big surprise there, I don't think. I thought maybe we could beat Phoenix, but I knew for sure that we'd be able to beat Buffalo. Did you watch those games? What'd you think? Uh, they were... It's one of those things that the competition, each of them plays very boring hockey. And, you know, it, we did all right against them. You know, like Buffalo, that the first two periods of that game, it showed why each team is where they are in the standings. And, you know, it... You know, none of the, neither of those teams are particularly good, so it's hard for the Flames to, you know, show well when the other team's not capable of fighting back properly. But at the same time, I think when you do have some young guys like we do, those are the kind of games that you need sometimes to help build their confidence. Oh yeah, definitely. And it's a learning experience, so they can understand how to you know actually beat the other team and like get up for those games instead of Mm -hmm. just you know like it's one thing to get up and all pumped for a team game like anaheim last week but you know it's a different thing getting up for a game against buffalo and if you look at those games i think you know the stories of those games to me was that mike camilleri continued to look amazing um, both games, Cammy, I thought played really well, and I wish we would have got this kind of performance from him earlier. He had a two point night against the Coyotes, getting an assist on both Calgary goals, and he had a one point night um, against Buffalo, getting a goal in the third period. Yeah, well, of the players that were traded, uh, Camilleri actually has more goals and points than any of them, so. Yeah, it would have been a good acquisition for someone if they wanted to actually pay the price. How many GMs now do you think are kicking themselves? Uh, probably everyone that talked to Calgary. Probably. And a couple other Flames notes. One that we I know you're interested in and I'm really excited about too is that Kenny Agostino, who the Flames signed uh, this week, he was acquired by the Flames last year in the Jerome McGinley trade. He was the other, I guess, prospect out there because we got a draft pick where we picked... Uh, Klimchuk, we got Agostino, and we got Hanowski. And those three came in. And uh, Agostino's been playing in Yale. He's he His team just got eliminated, so he's now been signed to a pro contract, and he'll be making his debut tomorrow night for the Flames. Yeah, uh, according to the practice they were having, he was on the line with Monaghan and Colborne. So he'll at least get a good opportunity at at least the beginning, to show what he has. And I'm looking forward to seeing him play just because I'm not exactly sure what type of player he is. He's a very max effort type of guy, but it's hard to peg how good his offensive abilities are. And that'll determine whether or not he's a depth forward or perhaps something more. And, you know, I think it's, I mean, I know it doesn't mean much at the college level, but this year with Yale, he played in uh, 33 games. He had 14 goals, 18 assists for a total of 32 points. So even at that level, he's almost a point a game player, which to me tells me that even if he's not going to be a top six guy, there's definitely some offensive upside there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, typically with college players, especially ones that are in their last season, if they're getting more than 30 points, a lot of them tend to become NHL players in some respect, even if that's only just as a depth 
like, fourth-line guy. Like, Eric Nystrom, for example, had, like, 30-plus points in each of his last two seasons. So, you know, you should get something that's useful. How good that is, though, it, you know, you just have to wait and see. I think for Ken Agostino, it's got to be hard because of how he got here. I mean, he was acquired as part of the Jerome McGinley deal. So I imagine there's going to be a lot of fans and probably a lot of people within the organization, too, that are expecting a lot of upside from him simply because of that, where if he was just signed or drafted, there may not have been that same expectation. So I think that's got to be hard for him coming into this league to have to deal with that. Yeah, like if I was him, I would try to just ignore that and it treat it as like if you just signed with Calgary instead of, you know, <laughs> probably that easier whole said thing. than done. Though. You know, I, like I understand, it, you know, it's a really tough situation. Like I remember Rene Corbet when he came here at, in the flurry trade that like he couldn't live up to fans' expectations, and he was gone shortly thereafter. So, who knows? And, you know, I was thinking about this right after Agostino signed, and, you know, being that I work in education myself, I'm thinking, his school year's not done yet. And I was uh, listening to an interview with him and then reading in the paper today that he's actually trying to study for his final exams. And, you know, being a Yale student, those aren't going to be easy exams while he's here. So you got to admire this kid's commitment. He wants to be a pro hockey player, but he's still, you know, he didn't just abandon his education. I guess he's so close. Why not? But he's trying to get both a Yale degree and an NHL career all at once. Yeah, well, all the power to him. You know, it, he only has a couple months left of school anyway, so it's not that bad, but, yeah, I don't envy him. <laughs> No, I mean, you know, learning a new system, learning a new game, being in a brand new city, I think all those things would be so overwhelming that trying to sit down and do your papers or study for your tests or whatever you have to do, it's got to be something that takes a lot of discipline. Yeah, it's not like there's any distractions at all. <laughs> exactly, you know, he's his whole world is changing, and so... Good on him. I hope he's able to graduate with a, you know, a passing GPA, whatever he's happy with, and get a degree. Because as we all know, uh, a NHL player's career doesn't last long, and especially a guy who might be a bubble player. It's going to be good to have a Yale degree to fall back on. Most definitely. The other good news this week we've been hearing is some of the injured players that are uh, coming back. We saw Glenn Cross come back this week. What would you think of his game? Uh, he Looked like the first couple of games back, but he's slowly getting more and more comfortable out there. So, yeah, it it's good to see him back. Yeah, you could tell that he'd been out for a while. Just some of the, the things he was doing on the ice and the way he was playing, but knowing Curtis Glencross, he will reacclimatize to the NHL very quickly. Yeah. And uh, Kerry Ramo says that he's ready. Um, I listened to an interview today where he says that if uh, Hartley said that he's ready to go, he'd be ready to step in. But Hartley said in an interview that Ramo will not play on Friday and that uh, Ordeo will get the start. So it looks like Ramo will back him up. But we do have a back-to-back this weekend, so I would not be surprised to see Ramo get the call in Edmonton. Yeah, and that's good as well. Uh, at least we don't have to watch jo- Joey McDonald again. <laughs> You know, and, uh, you know, it gives Ordeo another couple of chances the rest of the season to see if he's going to continue his good play lately. Yeah, and it looks like you called it last week when you said we'll go with the Finnish goaltending tandem. I wouldn't expect McDonald to last much longer once Ramo is in the lineup. I expect that uh, McDonald will be sent back to the AHL. Yeah. And uh, Yari Hoodler is also back. Um, it looks like he'll be in the lineup on Friday, so that'll be good to see him back. Uh, he's been a player that I always thought was one of the best overall players on this roster this year. So I think bringing him back and you know putting him on a line with some younger guys, perhaps, you might see a lot more of those younger guys. Yeah, and it's good, always good to get your prime offensive players back in the lineup, even if the games really don't matter all that much the rest of the way. 
You know, Bob Hartley was saying in an interview today, he said, with the Flames where they are and the season where it is, it would be easy for a lot of these players like Hoodler, like Ramo, to just tell the doctors, oh, I really don't feel like playing or I'm not totally 100%, and that they just generally go with that. So the fact that these guys want to play and the fact that they are bringing themselves back in the lineup, he says, shows, you know, a great passion for this team. Oh, yeah. And I'm... Of the veteran players that we have, I'm actually really liking the personalities that they have. They seem to be very team-first-minded players instead of some of the previous players that played for us, so that's always good. And well, I think especially in a rebuild, you need that. I mean, you can't just go out and get a bunch of guys that are selfish and you know arrogant and that sort of thing. I think more than anything, it's probably so important to build the team. Oh, definitely. And it definitely helps especially with effort levels and getting the young players to buy into a system like they have like you you see in Edmonton where like their their veterans were guys like Alish Hemsky and Sean Horkoff well neither of those guys is like overly consistent in their efforts no and you get all the young players coming in and they see that and you know it does rub off so i think too a lot of it is about and i'm seeing this more with hartley i think than we have in the past but it's about creating an identity for the team and i think if you're surrounding these young guys with great role models let's call it in a great room when they're young when those young guys then become the older guys, that's the way that they're going to be conditioned that the room should be. So you're really creating this, um, I don't know what to call it, I guess an atmosphere around what you want your room to be for a long time. Yeah, and seeing someone like Michael Backlund, who's the eldest of the young players, being, like, stepping up his game and being that, you know, all effort, all the time, everywhere at both ends of the ice type of guy, that does help a guy like Monaghan and Colborn, etc. figure out, like, oh, well, I have to be responsible here, here, and here, and, you know, every shift. You know, it's, it's interesting you bring up Backlund. I was actually looking at Backlund's stats the other day and talking to a friend of mine. I think that Backlund might be the most, like, if there was an award for most improved, I think that Backlund might get that award this year. I think that he's definitely upped his game and brought it to a new level, and he's playing in all three zones much better than I think we've seen him in the past. So I'm really happy by what we've seen with his progression this year. Oh, definitely. He's definitely emerged into either an elite third-line center or a good second-line center. Yeah, and I think for a rebuild, I mean, he's definitely the kind of offensive guy that we need. And whether he's a flame for his career or, you know, we can flip him for some later, I think either way he's going to be a valuable asset for this team. Yeah, and he, he does have a good personality for the type of team that we're looking for too, so that's always good. So with some of these guys coming back, with uh, Hoodler coming back, oh, and the other guy that is injured is, uh, it's been announced now that Weidman's out for the season. So unfortunately for him... He won't be coming back, which means that Tyler Watherspoon will probably be getting a full-time NHL gig. Always good to get an addition for somebody, at least. But with Hoodler coming back, who do you think ends up uh, getting sent back to the AHL or getting scratched so that Hoodler can get into the lineup? Well, if I was running the Lions, I'd likely just scratch Westgarth and have like the winger shift down a line. So. Yeah, yeah, that that makes sense to me. I didn't think of doing that. I mean, we know that they want to get Agostino in too, so they're gonna to have to scratch somebody else to get Agostino in. Yeah, it's one of those things that you have to give some of the young kids at least a taste to, you know. Like I can understand them sending guys like Knight and Reinhardt down because you know that they're likely gonna be in the NHL next year, full time. So. Yeah, you know, where guys like Kanowski and Agostino, they have to still like audition for the parts yeah so you know and we have enough lower line depth guys that like if you even sat a guy like Galliardi plus Westgarth and insert Agostino and Hoodler I don't think that would offend too many people that was exactly who I was thinking I thought you know what if I was gonna sit somebody just looking at the lineup 
there's none of the young guys that I would want to take out. So to me, I would either sit Galliardi or I'd sit Boma. I think either one of those pieces we could fit somebody else in nicely into their spot in the lineup. Oh, I wouldn't sit Boma just because he's been doing so well lately. And he has been, like, the shot block king lately, so... But other than that, you know, like, you know, for what he... The type of player he is, you know, he's doing a great job, so... You know, I'd like to keep rewarding him for that. Yeah, and and just thinking about saying that, you're right, and I think it's probably a good inspiration for the young guys to have him around, because really he was the guy that made it out of training camp this year. He's one of the few that, you know, was an AHL guy last year and made it all year on the on in the lineup, so it's probably good to have him in the lineup with these young guys. Well, Matt, let's uh, move on to what we were going to talk about this week, what we've been telling people we're going to talk about, and that is starting to profile some of the Flames' prospects. As the season is winding down, there's less current Flames news to talk about, so we figured that we would look ahead to next year and look ahead in the rebuild and start talking about some Flames' prospects. And let's start off with the defensemen this week. Okay. So these are guys that are both young guys playing at the NHL level, um, you know, older guys who are in the system, but really these are the guys that we think right now are going to be the future of the Flames going forward or could potentially be the future of the Flames. So why don't we start out with perhaps the biggest name of this group, which is TJ Brody. TJ Brody's played 69 games this year for the Flames. He's got 25 points, and he's currently sitting in a minus three. Um, why don't you start with your thoughts on Brody so far? Well, it, Brody is the definition of a prospect that you need to have patience for. It, you know, he was a fourth-round pick, and when he was drafted, he basically looked like a forward out there on defense. But since then, he has learned how to play the defensive game, surprisingly at some of the expense of his offensive game. And, you know, he's actually developed into a top pairing ish defenseman in the NHL. Whether in the like if the Flames had more depth he'd be in the third defenseman, uh, you know, that's up for argument, but you know, he has shown that he is definitely a top flight defender in this league. Yeah, and you know, even being a number three guy is still, you know, a great place to be in. You know, to me, that anywhere that you can slot into the top four defense and you're doing pretty well, especially when he's 23 years old and we're thinking of him as a top two, maybe three defenseman. Which I don't think anybody would have seen when he first got drafted. <laughs> no, and he was drafted... Um... He was he was drafted 114th, so fourth round in 2008, and he was playing in the OHL at the time. And you know he played in the uh, in the AHL. He had a pretty good first season in the AHL, where he played for the Heat. He played uh, 68 games, had 34 points, and then the next season he got called up to the Flames, and that was the year that he kind of made the team out of training camp. And he kind of went up and down that year. But I remember looking at this guy going, okay. They must be short a defenseman or something because this is not, at the time, the guy that I thought was the top prospect to make the team. And he's definitely, you know, I think won a lot of people over and he's had to earn a lot of the respect that he's getting now. Yeah. Well, it's somewhat similar to Giordano in some respects. Like once Gio got the captaincy, like his game has gone to a completely different level. And when Brody... Like, in the the preseason that that year, like, he looked lost defensively, but when he actually got put on the team to start the year, something clicked, and, like, he started figuring out the defensive game, and, like, from that point on, he's steadily improved on that to the point where he is a very good two-way defender. And, you know, I think for him, we've seen a lot of growth, too. Like you said, he was very offensive, and now we're seeing growth there. And to me, it makes me wonder, if he's 23 and we're seeing the kind of development we're seeing from him, what can we expect from this guy as he gets, you know, three, four more years down the road and he's at kind of his peak age in the league? This guy could be a really, really dangerous defenseman. Oh, definitely. There's still room to grow. If you look at a lot of the defensemen we'll be talking about today, a lot of them are drafted in the middle of the draft, rounds four, five, six. So I think, you know, one thing that Brody proves to us is that 
round four can still be a great place to find NHL ready guys. I mean, there's no doubt that Brody's ready for the NHL. He's making mistakes, but he's still a young player. But, you know, we've had GMs in the past that like to trade those middle round picks. And it really makes you look and go, okay, if we can get Brody in round four, who else might we be missing out on when we're trading those four and five picks? Well, it also depends on, like, who you're getting in return. Like True, um, yeah. Like, when you're trading yeah. one for Chris Russell, you're pretty much getting the best thing you could get at that round. Yeah, or Colborn or whatever. It... It's one of those things, it just depends. Because, <laughs> you know, in a common draft year, like, you might not find a Brody in the fourth round. Like, the 08 draft was kind of like the defenseman draft that year, like, where you had so many guys like Eric Carlson, Tyler Myers, Drew Doughty, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, like, it, that kind of extended all the way through the draft a bit, so... Yeah, it it depends, but you know, I I always like taking defensemen in the second through fourth round, just because usually when you have a defenseman there, they have some good skill, but they're lacking in other areas of the game, and defensemen do take a while to figure it out. And, like, Brody, he was, like, basically a forward when he was drafted. But, like, the rest of his game was subpar, but he figured it out. So if you can get someone with that good skill and, you know, teach them the rest of the game, you might get somebody that's actually good out of it. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I think you're right. I mean, there's not a lot of times you want to draft a defenseman in the first round. You know, Dion Phaneuf, we've drafted in the first round. Arguably an exception. I mean, he's a great defenseman. But, yeah, I think generally drafting between rounds two and round five for defensemen is a good place to draft them because they do take longer to develop. Mm -hmm. And usually forwards, they tend to, like, especially in the first 15, they tend to be more guaranteed to be a top six guy, where defensemen, it's a bit of a dartboard time. <laughs> well, speaking of you know guys that we drafted later, um, or I should say earlier, ra- second round pick, number 42 overall in 2012, the Flames used that pick to draft Patrick Seeloff. And Seeloff's a bit of a, I guess, a sad story here. I thought he had a lot of potential when he was drafted. Uh, he played for the Windsor Spitfires in 2012-2013. 45 games, 11 points, 85 penalty minutes. He's more of a physical defenseman. But this year he's had an injury, and he only played two games with the Abbotsford Heat this year at age 19. So that's probably going to set him back in his development, unfortunately. Uh, yes and no. Like When I saw him back in July and September, uh, he looked physically ready to be an NHL defenseman. So it's not like, you know, you don't like seeing a player miss most of the season. But, you know, he was almost NHL ready then, so... What kind of uh, defenseman would you say that, based on what you've seen and what you know about him, he would turn into? Um, Maybe there's a player you can compare him to? Uh, the best comparison that I can think of is a guy like Corey Sarich. Just, uh, really, Sealoff's more, like, willing to throw a hit all the time where Sarich would pick his spots, but, you know, it, that's probably the closest that I can think of in recent Flames history. I've only seen Seeloff play a few times. Um, I watched one of the games they played with Abbotsford, and I watched a couple Windsor games when I just catch the OHL on the web being streamed. And yeah, that sounds about right to me. He seems like he's more of a physical defenseman than a lot of the guys that we have in the system. Obviously, you can train him on, you know, when to hit, when perhaps not to hit, that sort of thing. But yeah, he seems like he's more of a stay-at-home defenseman, more of that kind of the brick wall almost, the guy you got to make it through to get over the blue line. Yeah. Sarich Ser- probably makes sense as a comparison. Yeah. If Seeloff was a couple inches taller, then maybe a Regeer type comparison, but you know, he was only six feet, so. Uh, Regeer probably had more offensive upside than Seeloff does, though. N- you're splitting hairs because, you know, all three of them are not going to 
put very many points on the board. So, Looking at another second-round pick of the Flames, uh, in 2011, the year before Patrick Seeloff, the Flames used their 57th overall pick, their second-round pick, to draft Tyler Watherspoon, a 21-year-old defenseman from Surrey, who we're now seeing on the NHL roster this year, playing his first NHL games. He's played seven of them so far. Uh, got one assist, and he is pretty much the replacement for Dennis Weidman at this point. What do you think of what you've seen of Watherspoon at the NHL level so far? I haven't really noticed him much, which, for a rookie defenseman, that is pretty much awesome. So, you know, like, I haven't really seen too many boneheaded mistakes from him, so... Yeah, as long as he keep as long as he keeps that up and just you know plays a steady game, then you know you could conceivably see him taking Butler's spot on the team next year. So who knows? Yeah, you're right. For a young defenseman, especially a call up defenseman, you really you're right. You don't want to notice them because generally, if you're noticing them, it's because they made a big mistake. Um, but yeah, he just kind of blends in. He seems like he fits well. He seems like he's got the speed that he needs for the NHL. His game seems about ready for the NHL. We haven't noticed him being out of position or, you know, behind the play or anything like that. Um, and yeah, I think you're right. I think he probably could replace Butler. I think, wasn't he one of the last cuts at training camp? Yeah. I think if the Flames only had, like, six NHL defensemen back then, he might not have got cut. But they had eight at the time, so... Yeah, you know, it's kind of hard to justify. Yeah, and Butler, Butler is a UFA. He didn't get traded. It's unlikely. Even Brian Burke has said it's unlikely they will sign him. So, yeah, I could definitely see Watherspoon being the number one guy for that uh, role. Yeah. And, you know, like moving forward, if he becomes a quality 5-6 guy, sort of in the Smeed-ish role of, you know, just being a good defensive defenseman, that'd be good. And, you know, if you look at the Brian Burke type player, if we want to make that kind of comparison, because I think even when we get a new GM, we'll probably still be looking at Brian Burke type players. Um, Wotherspoon's six two, 210 pounds, where Butler is 6'1", 196. So he's a bigger guy. Um, we, know, we know that Burke's high on Smead, who's 6'3". So, yeah, I can definitely see him liking that, uh, that bigger boy in Tyler Wotherspoon. Yeah, well... One of the areas that I thought was a major concern at the beginning of the year was the size of our defensemen. Because, like, Brody's not overly tall or big physically. Giordano, Brody's listed 6'1", 182. Yeah, Giordano's not huge. 6'2", 200 pounds. You know, so, and you just go through, like, Russell's not Russell's that big. Russell's 5'10". Butler, like, you know, you just go through the whole list. Yeah. Like, there's not a lot of size there. So getting guys like Watherspoon and Smead in yeah, there. Yeah, I think that that's are... probably a big reason why the Flames traded for Smead, because he a, he's a big defenseman and they needed more size. Yeah, and it, especially in our division where, you know, you got L.A. and San Jose and Anaheim where all their players are freaking huge. <laughs> Yeah, no, you know, for sure. Yeah, you know, like Kopitar could just like push over some of our defensemen. So, you know, like that's not good. <laughs> no, it's not. And, you know, Tyler Wotherspoon, I've seen him play in Abbotsford when I was watching some Abbotsford games there. I've reached out to a couple people I know who are big Abbotsford fans. They said that con- he was one of the best defensemen on the ice consistently. Every time I saw an Abbotsford game, like you said, I either didn't notice him or I noticed him for the right reasons. He seems like, for a 21-year-old, he's got his game together. And so, yeah, I think he's probably one of the major candidates to be brought up. Another guy that is in the system, who we just signed, and we talked about this last week, um, is Brett Kulak, a 20-year-old who's playing for the Vancouver Giants. And uh, he just signed a three-year deal. I believe it's 900 a year on a two-way. That's his NHL salary. Um, we talked a little bit about Kulak last week, but anything else you want to add there? Uh, the book on him is that he has the best slap shot amongst all of our prospects on the back end. So, it's the same sort of thing like with Brody, like what I was mentioning there. He's got a good NHL caliber shot. 
So if they can teach him the rest of the game, whether it's like defensive positioning, whatever, and he progresses, then he could become a good scoring defenseman. But, you know, like all prospects, that takes time and, you know, whether they figure out it out or not. Well, if you look at his stats this year with the Vancouver Giants, um, he's played 69 games, 14 goals, 46 assists, which gives him 60 points in 60 games. So even at the WHL level for a defenseman, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. Very skilled. Yeah, if he's getting 46 assists, he's the kind of guy who's going to be a puck-moving defenseman. Um, I haven't seen a lot of him, so I can't say a lot about what I've seen, but... Just looking at those numbers, I think, you know, they're definitely going to have to give him a look at some point. Yeah. Well, him and Ryan Culkin, who's next on our preview, it's actually kind of freakish how close they are in terms of, like, their overall game. Like, the only thing that really separates them is Kulak has a way better shot than Culkin, but, you know, it's not like Culkin's bad. It's just, you know... Kulak's got, like, a more, like, Dennis Weidman shot than... Well, and that might be the reason why Kulak may get, you know, a seventh defenseman spot and Culkin might get an AHL spot in the future because if you've got that one big asset that's hard to find yeah. in a slap shot, that's going to, you know, promote you up the depth chart. Definitely. So, yeah, we, we may see that Kulak gets the break in the NHL before Culkin just because of that. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, Kulak just got signed, but Ryan Culkin, who you're mentioning, has not been signed. He's a fifth round pick from 2012, um, and he's played his whole career in the QMJHL. He's played for the Quebec Remparts for most of his career, and this year he's, he went to Drummondville. Um, he, have they, have you heard anything if they're planning to sign him or if they made him an offer at all? I haven't heard anything. I haven't heard anything either, but it would be kind of, especially with the Flames' depth problems at defense it'd be kind of stupid to waste an asset especially one that's doing as good as Culkin is so you know I would be somewhat shocked if we don't sign him the only reason I can see them not sign him is I don't know how many contracts we currently have but there might be guys that they see with more upside there 42 and I think a couple are expiring like honestly so you get, what, 50 contracts? Yeah, there's yeah. definitely room to sign them then. Yeah, and honestly, both Kulak and Culkin at the same time, uh, that Brody was like at the same age, the, they're both ahead of him in their overall game. And like while Brody took like several huge quantum leaps forward, you know, Kulak and Culkin still are a undetermined asset, so you have to at least see what they have. Like, if they don't go anywhere, then, you know, at least you tried, but... Yeah, and, you know, it wouldn't hurt to sign them somewhere near the league minimum. I don't even know what the minimum is anymore, but, like, a 600,000 three years on a two-way. If nothing else, they're going to be great uh, depth defensemen in Abbotsford for a couple of years. Yeah, and... Likely we have a few expiring contracts on the farm for the defensemen like Breen, where if you replace them with a younger kid that has upside, that might be beneficial for the team down there. Well, and for every guy that we call up, we're going to need to replace them with somebody. So if we are talking that Wortherspoon might get a call up next year, they're going to have to fill his hole with someone. Mm -hmm. Um, Can you see either Kulak or Culkin? being signed and being sent to the AHL right away to um, help fill some holes in Abbotsford? Uh, it depends on when their seasons end. I don't really know how Vancouver or Drummondville are doing. So, you know. Does that burn a contract year if they do that? I honestly have no clue. I don't think so. Because so, I know with Agostino, it's burning a, a pro year to have him in the NHL this year, but I don't know what happens. Yeah, I think that's different because of his age. I think because uh, Kulak and Culkin are 20 years old that it would slide, I think. No, so I, that... I'm, I'm just remembering here, because we looked at this last year, is they could not play their on their Flames contract. They'd have to be signed to a 
pro tryout agreement by Abbotsford. Oh, and yeah, it yeah, doesn't yeah. count as a as a year on their Flames contract. So a little bit of a technicality there, but it sounds like there's ways that we could do it if we wanted to. Yeah. And, you know, like if they're done bef- in their junior careers before Abbotsford's done this year, then I could definitely see them going on a PTO. Yeah, well, it's nice, too, that Conroy is the GM of sorts in Abbotsford because we know that he's close with what's going on up here, so he probably has his lines of communication open of, yeah, there's a guy we want to look at. Go sign him to a PTO. Yeah, exactly. The next guy on our list is a defenseman that I've I've liked for a while. Um, I liked him when he was a U when he was at the University of Wisconsin, and that is John Ramage. He's a 23 year old prospect, so he's get, he's a bit older. He's one of those guys that probably soon we're gonna have to decide what to do with, either get rid of him or promote him. And he was drafted in the fourth round in 2010 by the Flames. Uh, played in Abbotsford this year, 50 games, and only had one point, but 46 penalty minutes during that time. Yeah, uh, it's one of those things that with a prospect like Ramage, we should have been seeing more by now. So I don't know, like other outside of a cup of coffee in the NHL, I don't think that he'll actually make it. Like I do like him. It's just you know it, you're supposed to take steps forward in your development, and I think he's just kind of staying at the level he's at. So, you know, it's one of those things, give him another year and see if he's got anything, and if not, then just move on to the next person. Yeah, I think Ramage probably got a better billing than he perhaps should have early on because his father was Rob Ramage, who played in the NHL. Um, So I think a lot of people thought that he came from good stock. Um, I think he was fine in University of Wisconsin at that level. I mean, that's a very different level of hockey, but... Yeah, you're right. He's 23. Um, you know, he could play another year. I don't know what his contract status is, but he could play another year maybe in the AHL as a, you know, 5-6 defenseman. And I think by 24, 25, if you're not seeing anything, he's got to go. And I really don't think he's going to be making the jump to the NHL with some of the guys that we're looking at who are above him. Yeah. Um, and it looks like Ramage actually got sent down from Abbotsford to Alaska this year. So, you know, when you're a defenseman being sent down to the ECHL, it's generally because the team's not seeing what they want in you at the AHL level. Yeah. Usually the only players that go to the ECHL and then make it to the NHL full-time are goalies. So, Yeah, for goalies, it's not really a demotion. It's a chance to get some play time. But if you're a forward or defenseman playing in the ECHL for more than a couple games, it's generally because your team has banished you. Yeah. Not good. No. But, you know, we're going to have those guys, right? We need farm team guys, farm team filler guys as well. And we're seeing that this year with Abbotsford, that they're doing well because they have some good young players. So I think Ramage might have a career as an AHL guy. He might have a good career over in Europe, but I don't think that he's going to be an NHL regular anytime soon. Yep, and that's why we need as many prospects as we can because competition always leads to the best players rising to the top. So Exactly, and, and it gives us options. You know, it's not like we're calling Ramage up because he's the only guy we've got. I mean, you know, I think everyone that we've talked about so far – Seelov, Wotherspoon, Kulak, Kalkin, they're probably all above Ramage in the depth chart. So it gives us a lot of options. Yeah. What about the next guy? Do you think that he'd be above um, John Ramage in the depth chart, Keenan Kanzig? Uh, yes, likely. Uh, I'm not really big on Kanzig. And there, the only reason why I'm not is that he is not quick as a defenseman. And usually if you're a slow defenseman, like, unless you're, like, exceptional at your defensive game, like Hal Gill was, like, that's pretty much the only way you can make the NHL is, like, if you are pristine at, like, your positioning as a defenseman. And, you know, I don't see Kul- or Kanzig being that good. So unless his foot speed improves steadily, then I think he's basically just uh, Chris Breen 2.0. Probably not even Chris Breen, a poor man's Chris Breen, I'd say. Yeah, 
And, like, that's not like I'm writing him off. It's just, like, he does need to figure out how to get faster. He He's a guy that I've seen play in the WHL. I've seen a, him a couple times when Victoria's been here to play the Hitmen. Scoring... Um, you know, passing not his strong points. This is a guy who gets huge penalty minutes. In 2011-2012, uh, he had 66 penalty minutes in 63 games. In 2012-2013, he had 159 penalty minutes in 70 games. And this year, he's got 99 penalty minutes in 63 games. So, more of an agitator, and you can see that when he plays too. Uh, more of a physical guy. He may be able to stick around the organization, whether it's as a call-up or in the AHL, because of that. I think you're right. He needs better foot speed, but he's six foot seven, so he's a big boy, and I think that that might get him more chances than maybe he deserves. Yeah, and that literally is the only reason why he would get as many chances as he'll likely get. You know, and like that, like I know it sounds like I'm trashing him, but you know it. It's really hard for tall defensemen to, you know, that don't have good foot speed to overcome that. Like, if you've looked at previous drafts, like, especially in the first round, you always see some giant guy like Vladimir Malak and Mihailik, and, you know, he and, like, so many others just do not go anywhere because they're just not fast enough, even though, like, they're 6'7", 6'8", 6'9". Well, yeah, I don't I don't think when you're bringing a guy like that onto your roster, you're really looking them for them to be the, the biggest, speediest guy, because it is very rare. But there is a space, especially on a Brian Burke-style team, where you're looking for guys with truculence, perhaps for a Keenan Kanzig-style defenseman. Yeah. It's just, it's very hard for those type of guys to overcome that deficiency. And, you know, we got time and, you know, obviously space for them to at least try to get there. But, you know, of all of our prospects that have a realistic shot at the NHL, I'd probably put him at the bottom. I think Kanzig will be an interesting career to watch. I can see him being one of these guys that gets passed from organization to organization through trades and UFA because everybody thinks there's got to be something to this kid or we can make him work just because of his size. I can see him getting a lot of shots, be it almost like an Eric Nystrom where he's you know bounced from organization to organization. And whether it's at the NHL level, even a Dustin Boyd for a while who was moving all the way around and it's like, okay, there's got to be something to this guy. Why can nobody figure it out? Yeah, exactly. Just wait and see. Yeah, I think he's lower on the depth chart. It'll be interesting to see what happens come training camp with him. Yeah, well, like, he definitely has the physical game ready, like, at an NHL level. It's just his foot speed is just that bad. And that's that's a huge deficiency in a game that, like you said, is a really hard thing to try and remedy in a young player. Mm Mm-hmm. The next guy on our list is actually one of my favorite prospects from what I've seen of him, and that's Eric Waugh, who we, uh, or Eric Roy, Waugh? I don't know. I, I think it's Roy, but I'm not um, 100% I, sure. I, I haven't heard them, I've seen him play, I haven't heard his name said in play-by-play a lot, but he's a fifth-round pick, he's sort of one of those sleeper guys, uh, in 2013. I've seen him play for the Weed Kings, he seems like a pretty steady young defenseman to me. Yeah. Well, he is basically the same mold of guy that Brody was, where he is very good offensively, but he is somewhat lacking in the defensive end. And, you know, like, at least, like, when he gets signed, uh, he'll likely be, like, the power play quarterback for Abbotsford. Whether or not he can figure out the defensive game enough to be an NHL defenseman, you know, like Brody, you just have to wait and see. I think, um, you know, something that not a lot of people know about him, he's 6'3", he's 180 pounds, he's a tall, thin kid. So I think before he could get much of an NHL career, he's going to have to bulk up, especially if he wants to be on a bigger Flames team than we'll probably see under Brian Burke. Oh yeah, most definitely. Because at 180, 6'3", he's going to be tall and 
thin. So he'll definitely need a bulk up there. But yeah, he's he always seems like a consistent defenseman to me. Every time I've seen the Weed Kings play the Hitmen or the Rebels um, around here, he seems like he's a good defenseman. Like you said, it'll probably be a power play uh, quarterback in the AHL. But I think he's a guy who, he's 19 right now. I can see him making the NHL at some point, but not right away. I think he's the kind of guy who needs a couple years seasoning in at the HL level before he's even considered for a jump to the NHL level. Yeah, definitely agree there. He's got a well-rounded game, but I just think he's going to need to take it to the next level to uh, to make it up mm-hmm. to the NHL. The next guy on our list I don't honestly know much about. Um, I'm hoping you do, and this is Rushin Rafikov. Yeah, uh I don't know a huge amount about him either, but, like, if he was Canadian, he would have likely been taken in the second round last year, or early third round. And he slipped quite far. He was taken 187th, which means he was a seventh round pick last year. Yeah, and, it you know, it's the whole Russian thing, and apparently um, he has been showing indications that he does want to come over to the uh, Can- Canadian junior teams. I don't know what league he'd be playing in, but, you know, he he has expressed some interest in that. So, you know, if that's the case and he progresses into something, that would be a very good seventh-round pick. If not, we took a shot, and that's all good. I saw him play at the uh, World Juniors, the under-18 tournament, in 2012, 2013, I think. Yeah, last season. Mm-hmm. And he didn't look too bad there. He didn't, you know, he wasn't the greatest guy on the team, but I thought that he looked like a solid uh, U18 guy. Yeah, uh, I saw the I same saw him thing. There. Yeah, I did. And that's basically what, you know, uh, somebody that uh, you could conceivably see in the second or third round. Like, he's not a complete defenseman, but there are elements to the game that look good. From what I know of Rafikov, from the research I've done on him, because, you know, I saw his name on this list and I thought I should look him up, a lot of people believe that he is going to probably make it to North America at some point, but nobody thinks he's going to be an NHL uh, mainstay. He might get a cup of coffee here or there. He might be that, you know, injury replacement guy you bring up for a bit. But a lot of people are saying his upside is AHL at best. Yeah. It's one of those things with... All defensemen, you can't really tell it until they're around 22. So, just got to be patient. I think that the fact he was drafted 7th round and he hasn't played in North America is going to hurt him too. I mean, we probably don't have as many scouts looking at him. And, you know, when you're looking up and down the roster, I think it's going to be harder to get, say, other teams to bite on perhaps acquiring him when he's a 7th round guy. Realistically, it's just one of those that you try and entice him to come over and play in the AHL, and you see if he magically develops or not. So while we're talking about these young guys, we should probably clear some things up for the listeners. When a young player's drafted, if they're playing Canadian hockey, so if they're playing in the OHL, the WHL, or the QMJHL, their NHL team gets two years of exclusive rights to them. So after two years... The rights expire and anyone can sign them as a UFA or in some cases they'll go back in the draft depending on their age. And anytime one of these guys is signed, they have to be signed to an entry level contract, which means it has to be a three year deal. They they can pay them whatever they want to, but the first contract for all these guys has to be a three year deal. So when we're thinking about some of these guys, those are the things that Matt and I are keeping in mind as well. That you know We've got two years after we draft them to s- decide if we want to sign them or not. And once we sign them, we're committed to at least three years. Yeah. And, you know, the thing is, is that like at the AHL level, you're likely going to see Sealoff and Watherspoon graduate shortly. So then you're... Abbotsford defense is basically Kulak, Culkin, Ramage, plus extras. Yeah. I think you'll probably see Watherspoon graduate first just because Seeloff missed the whole year. They'll probably want yeah. him to do one more in the A. Yeah, but like we're going to end up having depth issues down there so yeah. soon. So yeah, you might be more inclined to see someone that's more of a bubble guy get thrown in there just you know as a placeholder. 
Next guy on our list is another seventh round pick. Um, a guy that I honestly don't know too much about. He plays in Providence College, so he's playing with Jankowski. Yeah, and Gillies. And Gillies. And this is John Gilmore. He's a 20 year old defenseman. He's 5'11, 180 pounds, so he's going to be a smaller guy. Um, but, you know, 180 for 5'11, a guy who's going to fill that frame fairly well. He's probably a bigger boy. Uh, he's an offensive minded defenseman. I uh, I know his point totals in uh, Providence aren't far off of what Jankowski's are, and you know he's their power play quarterback, and he's doing a fairly decent job. I don't know as if there's enough upside there, but you know if he keeps progressing, you might throw him a contract and see where it goes. He's the kind of guy, like, again, I don't know a lot about him, but just looking at his numbers and looking at where he probably sits in the depth chart, he's the kind of guy I can see the Flames not signing, but getting signed by an AHL team. So playing in the A, but not under an AHL deal, or in the ECHL, but not under an AHL deal. Yeah, it just depends. You know, like, it, the, each of these guys is likely two years away from you know, needing a contract type of thing, like with Rafikoff and Gilmore, so... Yeah. Well, and the advantage that we're going to have with Gilmore is even though he's he was drafted 198th overall in the seventh round, um, because just by virtue that he's in Providence and we have some really hot prospects there, I imagine this team has seen a lot of John Gilmore, so probably more so than a lot of these guys. They probably already know what they've gotten John Gilmore and will continue to do so as they're down there quite a bit. Mm-hmm. You have to imagine we get scouts at Providence games pretty regularly because the Flames have a vested interest in that team right now. So those are those are the prospects. Those besides Brody, those are all the guys that are really our young players who um, you know probably have a shot at making it. Um, we've said Wortherspoon's probably going to be the next guy called up, then Seeloff, and I think after that, Kulak, Kulk, and Ramage, Kanzig, Waugh, Rafikov, and Gilmore. It's really going to be a fight to see who can prove their worth better than the other guy. I think Kulak's the only guy of those guys. Kulak and Seeloff that are pretty much guaranteed an AHL job. And Kalk and Ramage, Kanzig, Waugh, Rafikov, and Gilmore will be fighting for the positions that are left over the next couple of years. Yeah. And, you know, it's just one of those things that will unfold over the next year or two. And, you know, just got to be patient and see which of these guys steps up. Like, you know, based on just pure odds one of them should develop into an nhl player but you know who it will be who knows the next three guys on our list are guys that are already in the system guys who are already playing at the pro level in the ahl and have uh you know pro contracts are older guys the first one is a guy i don't know a lot about it's james martin he's a 22 year old uh defenseman He's kind of bounced around from the AHL to the ECHL. Um, this past year, he played two games for Abbotsford. And most of the, his time, 42 games spent in the ECHL. Did you see him in the summer when you were at the development camp at all? Yeah, and he's not a very good defenseman, to be He frank. wasn't drafted by the Flames, was he? No, I don't think so. I think it was just a uh, UFA signing. Okay. But, yeah, I, when... They had uh, drills there with Kulak, Culkin, Watherspoon, and Sealoff, amongst others. And, like, any time that he would be out there doing the same drills, like, you could see, like, there was a clear divide in talent between those top four guys and, like, everybody else. And Martin was, like, near the bottom of that totem pole, so... Yeah, I honestly, I wouldn't give him another contract at all. If he's a guy that's been playing most of the last couple seasons in the ECHL and he's, you know, a guy that the Flames hired um, to be a fill-in guy, I think that that's probably about where we'd expect him to be based on the fact he was a UFA. Um, I could see the Flames trying to give him another shot simply because he is still fairly young. But, yeah, I think there are guys who we've already touched on who could probably fill his role. Oh, and, easily. And who they would want to give a shot to because he, they were drafted and there's that sense of loyalty there. Yeah. Well, like, I'd even go so far as to, 
go and sign some other random UFA prospect, either from the NCAA or one of the junior teams, to take his spot, just because you need to improve, and I I haven't seen any at all, so Well, I mean, he's a guy we can on. do without, you know, yeah. I mean, even if we had to wait a year or so for Ken, you know, someone like Kanzig, if they want to give him a shot in Martin's spot, I mean, you could hire a guy for one year, or you could even leave it up to the HL team to sign a guy to fill that same type of role on their payroll instead of one of our contract spots. Like, to me, James Martin just seems like a waste of a contract spot for the Flames. Pretty much. And the next guy on our list who's also played most of his career in Abbotsford, he's actually been an alternate captain in Abbotsford this year, is uh, Chad Billens. He got a cup of coffee with the Flames this year. He played two games in the NHL, and he got two assists during that time. But he's been a pretty steady AHL guy from what I've seen. He played 58 games. Um, he's got nine goals, 27 assists for 36 points. And every time I've seen an AHL game, I haven't really noticed him a lot, which, as you've mentioned, is a good thing. He's not really a offensive player, but he seems like a very solid defenseman. Yeah. He's one of those types that it, he is an AHL all-star, and he might have a hard time actually cracking the NHL. Like, because of his size and he's not overly physical, like, it, it'll be hard for him to stick in the NHL unless he shows that he's a top offensive talent. And I don't think he has that in him. No, he seems like he's good for the HL level. Yeah. But I don't um, I don't think that his game is complete enough for him to really get much of an NHL career. No. So, you know, probably too bad because, you know, it's I always hate seeing AHL all-stars who don't move on to do much more because obviously there's some potential there. But especially when you look at this group, I don't think that he's the number one guy there. And the last guy on our list for today to look at, kind of a player that this organization, I'm not sure where he sits anymore, but this is Mark Kandari, who the Flames brought in as one part of the Jay Bomeister deal from um, St. Louis. And he really hasn't played at the NHL. I don't think he's... He made his pro debut with the Flames last year. He played four games. And I saw all four of those games. I thought he looked decent as a bottom uh, pairing, maybe number seven defenseman. What did you think of him last year? Uh, yeah, that's about where I'd put him. It's one of those situations where he kind of got past, though. And, you know, like, if you have, like, say you l- lose Butler this season, right, and your top five is Geo, Brody, uh, Russell, Weidman, and Smead, if you have Watherspoon and Sealoff as your 6-7 guys, there's no room for a guy like Mark Kandari because he's not as good as either of those players. So, you know, it's one of those things where this year he needed to take his game to an- yet another level, and we didn't see that. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. And then the Flames made a weird transaction with him, what, maybe about a month ago? Um, they traded him for all intents and purposes to Chicago Wolves for some um, AHL forward who's not under Flames contract, but it was a really weird deal because you can't make... The AHL teams can make trades, but not guys under Flames contract, so essentially they loaned him to the Wolves, and the Wolves loaned a forward to the Heat, which I've never heard of happening before. Yeah, it's one of those weird things. Uh, usually you only see a player getting loaned out if they have no future in the organization. And because Kandari's as short as he is, I don't see him having much upside. Kandari's 5'9", 195 pounds. This might be a bad comparison, but he seems like the defensive version of Akeem Alou. He's the blue line version of Alou where... They gave him a couple cups of coffee in the NHL. He was a prospect everyone thought might go somewhere and just really never panned out. And I think Kandari will probably have an AHL career. He's putting up decent AHL numbers. But I think that, you know, as far as what we got back for Bo Meester, he's definitely not the star of that package. Oh, no. Um, you know, like if that trade basically comes down to a first and a second round pick for 
Boom Easter. You know, I think that's adequate. You know, Poirier is doing a good job. And, you know, whatever that second round pick ends up being, that should be a decent prospect. Yeah, so just to reiterate where that comes from, we got a first round pick, which we turned into Emil Poirier, and then we got Rito Barra and Mark Kandari. We traded Rito Barra at the deadline for a second round pick this year. So we'll see what we get out of that. You should get a good guy out of that. You hope so. Looking at this list of defensemen, um, and looking at the NHL draft coming up, and the Flames will probably have a fairly good position in every round, do you think that we need to be going out and looking for a lot of defensemen this year? Do you think that we've got, you know, a good crop of defensemen ready to go over the next two, three years? Honestly, like, with our first selection, I would likely take a forward just because the chances of us getting Ekblad are pretty much zero at this point. Uh, But, you know, for our second round pick, the Avalanche second and our third, I would just spam defensemen. Uh, You know, the Flames have a lot of depth at forward, not necessarily star talent, but depth. And in that, we have quite a bit of depth there too. So, you know, but on defense, we need size, we need skill, we need pretty much everything. Like, even Watherspoon and Sealoff, who are the two best of our prospects... They're looking more like four, five, six guys in the same mold as Smead, give or take. You know, like that kind of a defensive defenseman. You need guys that can basically replace a guy like Giordano as like the top guy on the team. You know, like if we're going into contender mode in a few years, like... <sighs> We need our version of Brent Seabrook and Duncan Keith or, you know, our Drew Doughty or whatever. I'm not sure you're going to find those guys in this year's draft in the second round, though. No, but, you know, like if each of the next couple of years we just spam defensemen in the upper rounds, not necessarily the first, but, you know, second and beyond, we should be able to find someone that's, you know... Like uh, Shea Weber or somebody, it, you know. I yeah. it, it, The more darts you throw, like, defensemen are really hard to figure out. Like, you know, if anybody would have said that TJ Brody was going to develop into a top-pairing defenseman four years later, you know, he would not have gone in the fourth round. So, you know, you just have to it, try and... It's, qual- pull- it's quality through quantity almost. By having more defensemen, we have a better chance of getting one who's going to develop into a big star. Yeah. Well, like, Nashville in 2003, like, Shea Weber was the third guy they picked as a defenseman. And the other two were Kevin Klein and Ryan Suter. So, you know, like... It's one of those situations that... Like, if you get guys that have that high-end skill but perhaps don't have the rest of their game figured out and you get enough of them, one of them should figure it out somewhere along the line. So, you know, it it's one of those hard situations because it's not as easily definable that like oh i'm taking max or er, sam reinhardt because he's the best forward in the draft there's no clear cut yeah. way of picking a defenseman and saying oh he for sure will be the top pairing guy yeah no for sure and and that's where a lot of you know that's where the scouts get paid their money is to watch these guys over over time and really figure out who they think is going to be the right guy cuz you can't just pick based on the central scouting ranking when you get into the second and round and beyond in a weaker draft like this year. Yeah. Well, we'll see how these guys turn out. Um, we'll encourage everyone to tune in in the future. Over the coming weeks, we'll be doing the same type of analysis on other uh, positions within the team, uh, wingers, centermen, goalies, and hope that we can give the fans a good look at who's coming up through the organization um, over the next couple of years. Be sure to tune in next week when we plan to analyze the Flames' upcoming wingers. And next week we will also have an interview with former Flames captain and defenseman Todd Simpson who joined us for an interview, so that should be a lot of fun. 
Until then, don't forget to follow us on Twitter, at Fireside Chat. We're on Facebook, facebook.com slash Fireside Chat. We're on Google+, also our website, firesidechat.ca, where you can subscribe to be emailed when new episodes come out. Um, we're on iTunes. You can subscribe to us there. You can subscribe through, through Stitcher. So we hope that you will subscribe to us, find us, follow us through whatever online services you use, and we will see you guys next week. Fireside Chat is produced and edited by Dan Stevenson. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.